And the really neat thing is the partnership that those schools have developed over the past couple of years, especially. One of my favorite is a graduate of Phillips Academy, the Tim kind of postgraduate program, uh, has done an, in, did an internship last year uh, with our weekday school. She wants to go into early childhood education. So there's some neat ways that our two schools are, are working together and doing that. Second thing I want to tell you about is like every church, like all your churches, we're trying to figure out what in the world we're doing post pandemic what it is that God needs us to do in our community and in our world, and how that impacts and potentially changes us. We have a Way Forward Task Force, we call it. We're working with Atlantic Car from the Presbyterian Foundation uh, to come up with a new vision for a new trinity. So we're excited about how that is going to transform our church, our campus, in ways we can't even imagine yet. Um, if you need help at all during your time here this morning, you probably noticed there are a bunch of people with uh, purple shirts just make sure it has the Trinity logo. I see some of you have purple shirts and you may not know the answers to the things, but um, these are wonderful folks that have given up time on a Saturday morning, so thank them if you will first and then uh, they'll be happy to help you with whatever. And probably the most important information you'll get the entire time that you're here, there is an all-chair bathroom uh, in the back of the north decks here. There are also two restrooms down the hallway uh, by the Welcome Center. When we get to lunch, I'll give you instructions on how to get the fellowship hall. But again, we are so glad to have you all here this morning. Thank you so much. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Siblings, at the 223rd General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church USA, it was approved that all main councils would encourage, be encouraged, to begin our meetings with, the, and not, with an acknowledgement of the indigenous peoples who once lived in the places we now reside. We meet today on the land that once belonged to the Waxhaw, Sherrod, and Catawba tribes. And we remember them and their descendants on this day as we gather. I would now like to call and welcome any first time ruling elder commissioners and visitors to this Presbyterian meeting if you would be so kind as to stand so that we can acknowledge and welcome you. Any first time. Thank you, thank you, and welcome. And I would also like to ask if there are any corresponding members that needed to be seated. Yes, thank you, thank you. Can you please share your name again?
uh, happy to rejoice that Reverend Greg Mosley is now home after receiving his lung transplant, so he is coming home. Thank you, praise the Lord. A uh, few other uh, pastoral concerns that you see in the back. Please keep those folks in your prayers uh, and continue to lift them up. Families that are grieving, uh, we have quite a few of those in our presbytery. As far as the omnibus motion is concerned, there are just a couple of items. Um, the, the final report from the Administrative Commission to Mount Olive Church is in your packet to be received as information. And we gratefully dismiss that commission uh, with the Presbyterians at Delaware. Are they on Sand Hills Gang yes. Management Road? Right. Right. It took them a little longer than they expected, but we're grateful for all of their long time service. Also, the uh, final report from the Administrative Commission to dissolve the Plaza Church uh, also to be received as information and thanking them for their dedicated work in the closing of that church. Um, as you can see, there's a task force working on the future of that church uh, that has been appointed by council. And more information will be coming about that a little bit later. But those two motions to receive those reports. Um, oh, we walk out. Davis, the South Mecklenburg Church has been, um, has agreed to serve on the Committee on Preparation for Ministry in the class of 2023. Motion to uh, approve that election. And the following persons to be elected to serve on the board of the uh, Sheriff Towers, on the board of directors uh, Cleve Howard from the Myers Park United Methodist Church, and Curtis Pendlebach from Christ Episcopal Church. And one more item uh, the Coordination and Installation Commission uh, report. The service of coordination for Marcy Dope as Minister of Word Sacrament at Matthews Presbyterian Church. Those are the items for the omnibus motion. Moderator, I move the omnibus motion. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We will again approve hey. this through consent. Are there any objections to the um, any of the motions for the omnibus motion? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. in Christ. We continue to affirm that God's steadfast love is better than life. So our lips will praise the Lord and bless God as long as we can. Now let us continue together in worship. We are so grateful and excited to have the Reverend Gail Peterson, Belcito, the Associate Pastor of the Caldwell Presbyterian Church, bringing us the word today. Thanks to her, the entire worship leadership team, the musician here with us, and our communion stewards. Before we move, are there any instructions, though, for communion? Yes, I hope you got your communion element. If you have not, please simply do so. Amen. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. Let us worship God. Thank you. 
know that at night we will learn real quick. So let's sing that family this morning.
God overflows through us, for us, through Christ Jesus, who came into the world to save us sinners. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin together. Holy One, in your merciful presence, Friends, will you join me in prayer? Gracious God, we have come to the moment in this service of worship when we lean in, especially close, to hear a word from you. So please, living word, speak to us now, for your servants are here and we are listening. these 10 lepers. That's what the scripture tells us in Luke 17, verse 11. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. That's like saying he was going through the region between North Carolina and South Carolina. There is no such region, no such place, but we get the picture. In the middle, 
or perhaps on the border of nowhere. According to the purity laws laid out in Leviticus chapters 13 and 14, leprosy, which included several skin diseases and ailments, was cause for isolation and quarantine. So they were exactly where lepers were meant to be, outside of the city or the town, a place set apart from polite and clean society. What we know as Hansen's disease, our modern understanding of leprosy, is a treatable illness that affects the skin and the nerves of the hands and the feet, the lining of the nose and the eyes. Following exposure to this slow-growing bacteria called Mycobacterium lepra, it can take anywhere between one year and 20 years for the illness to become a full-grown infection. Left untreated, leprosy can cause skin ulcers and lesions, which are accompanied by a loss of sensation, a loss of feeling, and can lead to paralysis, blindness, and the eventual loss of digits and extremities. Even though it is eminently treatable, leprosy continues to have a terrible reputation. Just hearing the word spoken aloud causes a certain revulsion, doesn't it? Here in the United States, leprosy is rarely diagnosed, but that doesn't mean that we are free from the contagion of fear and stigma that come along with its mere mention. I stand before you this morning asking you to consider the possibility that we are dealing with an insidious strain of spiritual leprosy in our churches, in our presbytery, in our denomination, and in us. Here's why I think so. Many of us look on with decreasing levels of sadness as individual congregations fall off sometimes intentionally severing their connection from the body of the PCUSA denomination for reasons that are not always clear. Some among us think that we've gone too far with all this anti-racism stuff and refuse to participate in the work of dismantling white supremacist delusion. They feel no discomfort over the destruction that the evil of racism has brought and continues to wreak in our nation and in our church. As Kate Murphy preached at the last Presbytery meeting, some of our churches are anesthetized by enormous endowments while other congregations can't even meet in their buildings because of problems like mold and other repairs that must be done, repairs that they simply cannot afford. While some churches in this Presbytery can pay eight or ten or more full-time staff members, others can barely afford to pay for a weekly pulpit supply, never mind support a full-time ordained and installed minister. We shrug our well-padded shoulders even as we lose sensation in our regional extremities. Those who are on the margins of our presbytery, those on the outside of our circles of power wealth, we'll pray for them, but we don't necessarily feel any pain associated with their suffering. Having lost sensation in the nerves of our eyes, we can't even see them anymore, whoever they are. Having lost the sensation in the lining of our nostrils, we can no longer smell the stench of death around us and among us. How many years will we allow this numbness to spread before it reaches our hearts? Perhaps that time has already come. On a personal level, do you feel sorrow anymore when you hear of the dissolution of a congregation and the closing of a church? Do you feel any pain anymore when you look around the sanctuary and see an empty place where members of your faith family used to sit? Do you wince anymore when you hear the story of another life lost to gun violence, or police brutality, or drug addiction, or the lack of adequate housing? When you hear about the ongoing loss of life due to COVID-19, do you even feel any compassion anymore for those who've been left widowed, orphaned, unaccompanied, and unprotected? 
If the loss of voting rights or reproductive freedom or the ability to live as one's full self in the world and in the church, if it doesn't affect you directly, do you grieve and then take action on behalf of those that are affected anymore? Have we lost all the feeling at our extremities, at our margins, and our edges? Have you and I? But back to our story. Jesus was on his way to the cross in Jerusalem when he encountered those ten lepers. They kept their distance, crying out for mercy and compassion. The phrase they used was sometimes used as a way to ask for money, so they could have been saying, Jesus, Master, please give us some money. But ultimately, it doesn't matter what they were asking for. What they received was healing from the great physician. What they received was direction from the one who himself was the way. What they received was new life from the one who was like all by himself. Jesus sent them to the priest because in order for lepers to be restored to their lives, to their families and friends, to work and worship, they needed to show themselves, to literally bear themselves so that the priest could declare that they were disease free that the leprosy, the skin infection, had been healed. Luke 17, 14, especially the second half of that verse is one of my favorite Bible verses of all, although I must confess that I probably use that phrase a little too often in my sermon. <laughs> Seriously, this is one of my top ten favorite <laughs> As they went, they were made clean. The first part of that Greek phrase is sometimes translated as in the going. As they went in the going, they were made clean. They were not told to wait until they were fully healed before they went. They were not told even to wait until they saw the beginning signs of healing before they went. Jesus told them to go and they went, period. And in the going, as they went, they were made clean. As the well-trained, highly educated, decent and orderly Presbyterians that we are, we are known to admit how challenging it would be for us to set out on such a journey without a properly and decently worded motion, setting <laughs> an adequate discussion before calling the question on the feasibility and the reasonability of such an undertaking. <laughs> As the well-trained, highly educated, decent, and orderly Presbyterians that we are, moving forward solely in obedience to Jesus' command, without any explanation offered, or any outcome guaranteed would, and in fact often does, prove nearly impossible. But as far as I can tell, we are still commanded to go into all world and preach the gospel, teaching what Jesus taught, making disciples, baptizing those who God has claimed as God's own. As far as I can tell, we are all still called to be Matthew 25 people in churches, feeding the hungry, giving water to the thirsty, welcoming the alien and the stranger, calling the naked, and visiting the sick and in prison. As far as I can tell, we are still being told to do justice, love kindness, and love as far as I can tell, nowhere are we told to figure it all out, make sure all the budget numbers line up, and have every big giver and estate planner on board before we tell the truth about how we got all the money, and then proceed to use our multi-million dollar forward-facing endowments to take care of those among us who are housing, food, and health insecure right now. As far as I can tell, nowhere are we told to wait until we are fearless, whole, and healed before we do any of those things. We are simply told to go. And as we go, my friends, we are being made clean. We are being healed. We are being made whole. As we go and do the work of loving God's people, as we go about God's work and make decisions as members of sessions, as ministers of word and sacrament, as inquirers, as candidates, as parish associates, and as members of congregations, we are 
are being made full. As we finally name this slow moving bone deep leprosy that is spreading among us and within us, as we cry out to God desperate for restoration, healing, and wholeness, we are being made whole. Yeah. As some of us face, own, and ask God to break our addiction to power and influence, we are being made whole. Some of us learn to hold our tongues and center the voices that we have long marginalized or silenced. We are being made whole. As some of us lean into Jesus' declaration that we cannot serve both God and money, and as we decide how we will spend our money for the sake of God's reign and rule on earth rather than our own friends, we are being made whole. Yeah. As others of us face, own, and ask God to break our addiction to the belief that we have no power or influence. We are being made whole. As others of us ask God to embolden us to speak truth to power, we are being made whole. As others of us release ourselves from unnecessarily going to pastors, priests, and other people who will never welcome us in our voices, we are being made whole. As we go, in the going, in our trusting and our obeying, we are being made whole. I don't know about you, Charlotte Presbytery, but I believe that Jesus is still in the business of meeting us in the nowhere land places of our lives and sending us on our way toward wholeness, liberation, and healing. That is far more than skin deep. I believe that Jesus is still in the business of healing our souls and our churches even if our bodies are not healed. I believe that the spirit of the living God is still in the business of sustaining and empowering us to live lives of hope, joy, peace, and healing despite the repeated attempts of the enemy of our soul to keep us down in hopelessness, despair, and dis-ease. I don't know about you, but I believe that our Creator God is still in the business of making us new and making us one, even when we are in the midst of everything we are in the midst of as a world, as a nation, and as a denomination, even though our attendance will probably never be bound to pre-COVID level. Hear again the word of the Lord. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back. Praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. We don't have time this morning to delve into the challenges he would have faced upon trying to show himself to the priest because he was a Samaritan. And Samaritans were not loved in the synagogue. We don't have time this morning to deal with the ways that some of us, like that Samaritan leper, live with double outside of status. We don't have time this morning to deal with the many ways that some of us still maintain double insider status for ourselves and double outsider status for others. So let's use the time we have to deal with the gratitude part. That Samaritan knew that the healing and wholeness he was seeing and experiencing had not been of his own doing. He knew that because all he had done was obey what Jesus told him to do. All he had done was set out on a journey towards being declared clean, and as he went, he was made clean. In the going, he was made whole. The only thing that Samaritan knew to do in response to being made whole was to go back and give praise and thanks to Jesus for the unimaginable, unearned, unmerited miracle of healing that Jesus had bestowed on him. As members of the Presbyterian Church USA, as members of the Reformed faith tradition, we believe that it is only by God's grace that we have been saved. We believe and we publicly and regularly and rightly declare that we have done and can do nothing to deserve or earn God's grace and favor, but rather we have been named and claimed as God's own by virtue of God's goodness. 
We believe that our belongingness is not related to anything we have done. It is solely about what God has done through Jesus Christ. Amen. But if that is true, if we really believe that we are saved by grace alone, then why are so many of us so uptight and somber all the time? <laughs> if we have been so bountifully blessed with so great a salvation, not by the works of righteousness, but by God's will and mercy alone, why are we so profoundly unwilling to prostrate ourselves at God's feet and give God thanks? Why do we praise our awesome God with a loud voice? like that Samaritan did. When I was at the Montreal Youth Conference for two weeks in early June with Steve Lindsay, several times each week during either the morning keynote gathering or the evening worship gathering, we would sing a song called Reckless Love, written by Corey Asbury in 2018. Every time the title of that song appeared on the screen in Montreal's enormous auditorium, applause and shouts were erupted from the gathering group. They loved that song. Rather than sing it, they shouted it. And they are not alone in loving that song. The official lyrics video of that song on YouTube has more than 158,300,000 views. Two other renditions of that song have 24 million and 724,000 views, respectively. People love this song. I'm going to read a few of the lyrics to you now, and perhaps you'll understand why. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You've been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You've been so, so kind to me. The chorus says, oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. It chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away, oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. There's no shadow you won't light up. No mountain you won't climb up coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away, the overwhelming, Never-ending, reckless love of God. Can you understand why millions of people shout out those words in a melodious prayer to the one who loves them, who loves you, who loves me with that kind of reckless love? I am baffled as to why 10 out of 10 of us are not shouting it out, singing out loud in gratitude for the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God that is making us whole. Amen. My friends, even as we face and fight the social and spiritual leprosy that we have allowed to spread throughout our denomination, our churches, and our very selves, even as we do the sometimes humdrum, oftentimes life affirming almost always demanding work of the church, the presbytery, and the reign of God. Even as we teach and preach and lead and make the decisions that must be made as members of the faith communities to which we have been called, even though we will undoubtedly be called outsiders and outcasts when we do what God has called and commissioned us to do, even though each of us is walking through the valleys, the deepening shadow of death. Even now, perhaps especially now, our gratitude for the healing work that our ever gracious God has already done, the transforming work that our ever merciful God is doing now, and the unimaginable work that our ever faithful God is yet to do. Beloved children of God, our joy and our gratitude ought to be uncontainable. Because as we go, 
We are being transformed from glory to glory. In the going, we are being made to reflect the glorious image of our glorious and great God as we go. We are being made whole. Thanks be to God for that. Amen. Amen. Amen.
at registration when you came in. If you did not, uh, over at the store here, there is an offering plate with them in there. You can pick them up. We will take them uh, together after the words institutions that Lynn and I will, will give. There will be a time for you to do that. Um, we tell our moms in training with these kits because you see the juice and you want to take that off first, but take the bread off first so that you can then take the juice off and not get juice all over the place. <laughs> My friends, we got on board this table not because we must, but because we may. We come to this place seeking light to fill the darkness, peace to calm the disruption, joy to replace sadness, and love that can change hearts. We gather here knowing it is not our table, it is not a Trinity table, it is not a Presbyterian table or a Presbyterian table. It is God's table. God is the host of this meal, and we are God's guests. So let us now receive these gifts, the bread and the cup, with a grateful spirit, a repentant heart, and lives that can be changed. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. On the night that Jesus was with his friends, he took a loaf of bread and he broke it in their presence. And he said, this is my body that is broken for you. Take this and eat this, and as you do so, remember me. And also in the same way, after they had supped, he took the cup, and he poured it out and gave it to them, saying, This cup is the new covenant that is my blood, shed for the forgiveness of your sins and for the forgiveness of the sins of the world. Drink this in remembrance. So here, these words of institution that accompany the service that they have from the very beginning of the first night that Jesus shared it. Paul writes, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you. That on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it, saying, This is my body broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also, after took the cup and he said, this is the cup of salvation that is poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink this in remembrance. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you do proclaim my life, my death, and resurrection until I come. Amen.
worship moment into a time of predatory business. As we make that transition, may we do so with God's praise resounding within us, containing it only long enough to get through this meeting. And when we leave this place, may we go knowing that the God who created us, the Jesus who died and rose for us, the spirit that indwells and empowers us, goes within us, before us, behind us, and with us. Friends, as we go in the going, May we know that because of God's matchless grace, boundless mercy, and great faithfulness, we are being made whole. Amen. We've got to know where our culture is. And we need to switch a slide. Is it working? I don't know. It worked a second ago. Next slide, if you could. Um, here are some of the culture shifts that your churches may be making or maybe need to make and or have already made from a family church to a church that welcomes people who aren't from here. A lot of people are moving to North Carolina these days who are not from here. It's okay. God, Jesus died for them too, and we are thrilled to have them join us. 
from a church that doesn't talk about hard things to a church that does talk about hard things. So many of our churches, and especially as you're getting new pastors, we've got to talk about hard things to make sure that we are calling the right pastor for these days. A church that exists to survive, shifting to a church that not only wants to thrive, but addresses the needs of others in the name of Jesus Christ. Next slide. So before we can make plans, strategies, we need to ask two questions. Do we really want to make this shift, and why do we want to make this shift? Do we want new members, preferably people with young families and children, to come into the church so that we will survive, or do we want them to come so that they will learn the good news of Jesus Christ and grow in faith? Huge difference. Whoop. Mine worked also. <laughs> The Presbytery can help all of our congregations have these conversations. What is God telling us? How can we pay for it? We are blessed with a lot of grants. What are the trends and what is faith and what not trendy? Does that make sense? All right, I'm going to try mine. Oh, good. So, we are also a Presbytery that is shifting our culture, and you may have noticed that. We are shifting from a Presbytery that avoided talking about race to an anti-racist Presbytery. I stood at one of these microphones several meetings ago saying we are going to be an anti-racist Presbytery. It's not the same as being um, a non-racist Presbytery. Anti-racism is what I'm talking about here. And it's not enough to say that's what we want to do. We have to take clear action. This is what your Presbytery has done. We have required anti-racism training of all active pastors and committee members. Any of you can take anti-racism training too. It's all online. It is superb, even if you think you know everything about anti-racism world. Please sign up for it. And thanks to our anti-racism ministry team, this is happening. We have taken some of our money and put it in a black owned bank, in M and F bank. We have built a fund, or we're building a fund to help retired African American clergy who historically have not been compensated as well as their um, white colleagues that is in the works. This is something that different committees present to the Presbytery Council, and it's the council who makes those decisions on our behalf. If you're a member of the council right now, would you please stand? David Sanders is not a member of this church, but he's wearing a purple shirt. <laughs> Thanks, Council. We'll hear more from them later. Here's another paradigm shift I want us to make, and this is a really big one, but I want us to reframe who we are and stop thinking in terms of 92 separate churches. To shift from a presbytery of 92 low rangers to a single, well-connected church. Some of you have heard of Elevation. Their mothership is in Valentine. They have over 27,000 participants in four states in Canada. We have more people than that in 92 churches. We have almost 28,000 participants in 93 locations in seven counties. What if we thought of ourselves as a mega church? But we have a lot of different campuses. What if we went from a Presbytery of 92 Lone Ranger churches to a single, well-connected church? These are fighting words, my friends. Collaborating in mission projects, what an idea. <laughs> Partnering for VBS or Bible studies or book studies, sharing a pastor. That especially is a fighting word. But I'm telling you, if your church, for whatever reason, cannot afford or doesn't have a full-time pastor, partnering with another church, is life-giving, life-giving. It energizes everybody, it gives everybody an understanding of good boundaries and goals. Um, maybe sharing a church treasurer or an educator or an administrator. We can do these things. From we have our own to being the kind of uh, connectional church. Uh, the financial realities of 2023 are gonna make everybody wanna talk about money cash, the ABCs, but this is a thing. This is why I love Jesus, because Social Security could, re could recommend at least a 10% cost of li living adjustment for next year. We don't know yet unless something happened this week. 
The Board of Pensions dues, for those of us in the Board of Pensions, will increase to 39% of the effective salary, the first increase in a while. And the Presbyterian Charlotte will continue to offer grants to all congregations who contribute to the Presbyterian's mission. So if you're part of a church that has never participated in the Presbyterian's financial mission, even if you send $100 to participate, you will be able to get grants. Um, thank you to the churches that give way more than they have to give because they understand that connectional system that we have. And that is part of being Presbyterian. So when I tell you this story very quickly, when I was a pastor of a church in Virginia, we had, as you can imagine, we probably had a task force to decide whether or not to put a bin like this in the church parking lot. It's ugly, people said. What if people throw trash in there? We're going to all the things. It seems very simple. You put in your used clothes, somebody picks it up and gives it to someone else. So we finally, they all decided, yes, let's do it. And then when it was delivered to our church, they made a mistake and put it in the church parking lot across the street of a different church. Heaven forbid, the Methodists. <laughs> Everybody in our church is losing their mind all of a sudden because the Methodists are now going to get credit for doing this. We have got to shift the culture from getting credit and it's all about us and we did this to we did this to God did this. Okay? Um, no more Lone Rangers is my point. All right. It is a great time to be the Church of Jesus Christ. I'm not sure it's ever been a better time to be the Church of Jesus Christ. The prophet Jeremiah said, For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. There is enormous hope. Great things are happening. If you want to hear me, invite me to come talk to your people. Or after the second week, after the first week in September, invite Alice Rigel back. Alice is not here because she is serving our country in Washington, D.C., and then she's going to take a week's vacation, which she much deserves. The last thing I want to say is this. Two of us, the state of Clark and I, are wearing these shirts today, and you may not know who these people are, but the names on our shirts are all of the African-American women who have either been co-moderator or moderator of the General Assembly of our denomination. The first was Stella Adair. She was elected to be moderator in 1976, and on the 29th of this month, she will be 102 years old. She continues to be a servant of the Lord. The most recent name is the Reverend Siobhan Starling Lewis, who happens to be the pastor of the Great Memorial Presbyterian Church here in Charlotte. I want to share with you that it is the custom of our denomination that whenever a moderator or co-moderator who is currently serving is in your presence, that you stand to honor the, um, the office of the moderator. <laughs> Now that the assembly has completed, it was not to be ambassadors for the work itself. 
and it is a role that we both take very seriously and are very grateful for. Um, but it is something that we believe we do not call, are not called to do alone. So all of the advisory delegates, all of the commissioners, we are inviting them into the work too of translating. We are blessed in our presbytery will be a conversation that is taking place at Hopewell Presbyterian Church on August 31st, where there will be a conversation um, with uh, commissioners um, and uh, with Jan Edmondson, who served in this role as the moderator previously for the 222nd. No, correct, right, correct, right, right. So all these numbers, I'm trying to make sure I've gotten correct for everyone's years. But um, uh, the 222nd General Assembly, but we'll have a space here in our presbytery to ask to do some question and answer. Um, there were a lot of places in which the, the nomination through the General Assembly took bold actions and statements. And it is an amazing thing, but it is also something that requires translation, community, to be the connection of church that we've been called to be to understand what terms that may seem complex mean on the ground for our congregations, for our members, for our neighbors, for our communities that we are a part of, and how do we live into that in ways that are faithful, and how do we do discernment in a community together. Um, one of the things that Ruth and I ran our platform on and continue to live on into is what it means to be a church that is unbounded by God's faith, faithfulness, unbounded by the hope and strength that we have with God, so that we are all called to thrive together as well. So our phrase was unbounded, we thrive. And there we live in the main, the gift of a theology of flourishing, that we do not have to be in a space of scarcity. It was pointed to uh, in our general um, uh, executive presbyters, a uh, general presbyters um, report, but also it was true in every level of the church. There is, in the spaces of fear and concern, a tendency to to have scarcity. Be the first. We don't have it. It's being where we start from. We start with the no, rather than starting with the holy yes of what God is calling us to live into. Um, one of the spaces I've been blessed to learn about and connect with, and even at the African American Church Retreat recently, was supported by the work of Bible Congregations, um, which is one of the three parts of our um, Matthew 25 initiative for the General Assembly. Uh, from the Presbyterian Mission Agency, but there they talk about what it means to engage and have a congregation that is vital, alive, thriving, and gleaning from the many gifts that make up a congregational setting. Um, and that in that space, we recognize that God is doing a new thing, and it is good. Amen. Um, the other places that we've been able to lean into, even in the first few weeks of living into our call, is a theology, it, it living to our call as co moderators, is living in the space where we're recognizing the theology of call. Like one of the miracles is that God is still calling people into the work of the church. People are still showing up to our churches. Amen? Amen. <laughs> right. Like we're, we did at Memorial first, since I arrived as a pastor, our first members class. And it's heartening to know that God is calling consistently people who are leaning into their sense of call to walk closer with what God is up to. Um, and then the other part is the theology table. So what does it mean to participate, to live into, and to celebrate the places where God is allowing us to be aware that not just we're invited to the table, but we're called to be stewards of the tables that we're at. And we're called to make sure that there is space for everyone as our future name to show up authentically and fully themselves. I've noticed, and it's heartbreaking sometimes, the way that we only invite parts of people to show up. Amen? What would it mean, our theology, and what it means to be Presbyterians, what it means to be a part of the peace with what it means to be just followers of Christ, period, is that we invite people to show up as their full self and engage in the full healing and fullness and wellness of community and each other. I want to give a special shout out to our staff at our presbytery for the ways in which they supported our, us as commissioners um, in the work of discerning. I, I know that our commissioners will have a report as a whole, and the, most, the part that I missed out on in the role as, as co-moderator is that I wasn't in the very faithful deep work that was happening in the committee room. That work, I got to witness it, I got to support it, I got to pray for it, but I wasn't a part of it. But I want to commend all of our commissioners and advisory delegates who were in those spaces of discernment. Um, it's very easy to make assumptions when you're not in that space, amen? 
It's very easy to be upset with they, when they don't turn out the way when you're not in that space. And I, I just want to say that out loud. Because that's a part of discernment, is, is realizing that as a leader, everyone's not going to be okay with everything that doesn't happen in their purview. But the ways in which integrity were held in those spaces was holy. The ways in which people uh, made room and listened and faithfully in, lived into the biblical understanding and the scriptural and the ways in which people lived into the foundations of our theology in the moment as they were discerning was holy. Um, and so I invite you to continue to pray for living out and living into the many things that have come. There is a sheet, that's why I was tempted to, but there's actually a sheet in our packet that gives some of the highlights of what we voted on um, during the General Assembly. Um, I invite you to reach out to the commissioners as they come forward if you have questions too, because this is the kind of something we all live into. And there will be times during the next year which votes will come forward from things that were brought forth at the General Assembly for the President's hearing to vote on. But most importantly, I just want to say thank you being siblings in this work of being church together. I'm grateful that we get to do this together. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Before we move, because uh, commissioners come forward as we get ready to receive your report, I do want to thank Jan for that report. That was amazing. <laughs> um, and prayerfully, we will take this good information and um, good calling back to our congregations and not let it just sit, but actually do something with it. Um, we're fortunate. Some of us know our congregations that are close to our congregations. If you don't get to know them, um, that is very, very, very key and important. And then cross the line. Sometimes you'll be able to make connections with folks out east, folks down in South Charlotte, folks down out in uh, Montgomery County, just all over the place. Build those relationships. Jen, thank you so much. That was an amazing report. Thank you again, Madam Co-Moderator, for your presence, your leadership, um, just everything that you bring uh, to this office, this position, and you have been bringing to those of us who know you as sibling and colleague, um, and green girl, um, but all of us. Uh, amen. Thank you so much. And now we're going to hear our awesome report from the commissioners of the 225th General Assembly. Commissioners, take it away. And if your commissioner hasn't, haven't joined us up front, we invite you to come. We're not going to make all of us speak, so it'll be good for you. We did want to start with a little uh, timeline for this General Assembly because it was different. And it was long. Um, we began a different structure of having committee meetings at the New Presbyterian Center that was renovated for us beautifully. And we went through a long Zoom period. Our first assignment for the committee, we learned in April, in March and April, what committee we were serving on. Uh, the committee that I served on was the Rules of Discipline, and we had our first meeting on April 28th because we had a volume of reading to do together. So we kept in touch through email and Zoom meeting just to keep us going. Uh, we were divided into four groups to attend meetings in person at the Presbyterian Center. Um, the first group was group number one, which I was part of, and we flew out on Friday, June 17th, so that we would be there for Saturday for the plenaries and for the uh, seating of the new moderators and for all the wonderful opening ceremonies. Then Monday, June 20th through um, uh, the 22nd, we sat in committee meetings and uh, prepared for things to go to the floor. Then we came home and on July 5th through Saturday, July 9th, we were on Zoom, 57.5 hours on Zoom. And we do thank you for this press to this presbytery for their gifts of snacks. They were great the first eight hours. We had to kind of come down into some other things. So next time we have our board. <laughs> doing, it, doing it this way was um, hard at times, it was slow, it was tedious, it was lonely in moments, but it was a great way to serve this presbytery, to serve the church of Jesus Christ.
Christ and to serve the General Assembly. So it was good, but it was valuable. And we thank you for allowing us to represent you. I'm Vaughn Clemens, I honorably retired teaching elder commissioner. Uh, I served on the Theology Education Working uh, Committee. I just want to say a word about uh, General Assembly actions, because it's something we'll all need to keep in mind as we try to interpret what the GA 225 did uh, as we speak to our congregations and our communities about that. One of the foundational principles of the Presbyterian Church is that God alone is Lord of the conscience, which in our polity means that statements of any General Assembly binding on individual church members. Changes to the Constitution are binding on governing bodies and teaching elders, ruling elders, and deacons who affirm their allegiance to that Constitution. But other statements or policy may affect the agencies of the church. So it's important to remember that GA does not speak coercively for all Presbyterians. It does seem to speak persuasively. We may not agree with everything that PCUA say, says or does, but because we are connected and seeking to discern God's will, we do need to pay attention. I'm Sally Furlong, and as we always introduced ourselves at our meetings, we're teaching the elder commissioner from the first period of child. But not an operator, I'm going to complain about that because I was at the 222nd General Assembly where we voted to be ministers of the Lord of Sacrament and I'm going to be very much to you. I'll walk to you. A concern following the completely virtual 220th Assembly is that such meetings have a tendency to hinder social justice and equity concerns. And when sessions go long and participants become exhausted, the voices of those marginalized tend to get further suppressed. <laughs> so something implemented at the 225th General Assembly was the use of equity crimes. We were each given a card with these questions or equity crimes to consider. The crimes were a set of reminders for us to be methodical and inclusive in our deliberations and discernment. This was particularly important when topics for both divergent perspectives, and there were one or two of those. Um, and when Jan made her presentation, I thought these were perfect equity crimes for the Presbytery to use as well as we move into a shift. So during our discussions, and sometimes beforehand, we would individually or as a group take the opportunity to pause and consider these four crimes. Why are we making this decision and why now? Do we have enough information to make an equitable and inclusive decision considering have we heard directly from those who will be impacted and have we thought through the impact to the whole church? Who else might we need to hear from? And what information would lead to more equity? These crimes encouraged us to consider factors such as implicit bias, who has spoken and for how long and who hasn't spoken, for the far-reaching impacts our decisions would have on um, different communities, even those beyond the church. Another way these policies promoted inclusion and full participation was giving those requiring interpretation the time needed to adequately receive the information and allowing them time to think. One GA administrator said, it's easy to say we value a new way of being and that we make decisions based on our values, but it's hard to live into that new way of being. These crimes help lead us in that direction, and that same kind of thinking may lead you in that same kind of direction as well. Now, following the GA theme, we will each share, or some of us will share, um, what has given us calls to lament and reasons to hope. It was lament and hope was the theme, as a result of being commissioners to this general assembly. So I'll start. 
Something I consider a cause to lament, at least temporarily, is even though we have come so far as we are reforming, we still have such a long way to go, especially when we periodically take steps back. One of the many reasons I had hope was seeing the energy, intelligence, imagination, and love of the youth advisory delegates at the General Assembly. Another reason I have hope is that more and more people like me are entering seminary and ministry. I pray that they find an accepting place to live out their calls. Amen. I'm Heather McIntyre. Uh, I was serving on the fourth group of committees to go to General Assembly, GAMC, which is the General Assembly Minist Ministry Coordination Committee. Uh, and we did some of the things that people had a lot of feelings about. I will say that personally, I have always loved General Assembly, and it was a deep, deep blessing to be able to serve as a commissioner this time for my little church in Waynesboro. Um, the thing that caused me probably the most lament and the deepest grief was the way that our society as a whole's culture of mistrust and distrust has kind of found its way into our discernment processes as a denomination. When we come, we agree to work together to discern not our own will and not our Presbyterian will, but the will of Jesus Christ. And we're supposed to trust each other in that process as we disagree and offer opinions that we believe Jesus is calling us to bring to the table. But, like in most of our society, there is a real temptation to think less kindly of one another, to assume that the people who disagree with us are in fact our enemies instead of our siblings who are trying to help us reach a good point of understanding. So, my heart broke a couple of times. Uh, one was when, in my committee, a commissioner who was deeply disagreeing with several of things that were being debated, and had spoken several times, encountered a mic problem, and he got up and yelled loudly, I will not do silence. And I just wanted to say, no one is trying to silence you. This is a tech issue. <laughs> but at the same time, I could feel him, because when I encountered a couple of tech issues during plenary, my first immediate thought was, wait, who is it trying to allow me to speak? Who's not, who's trying to rush, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we saw the same thing during plenary, particularly because when you are online, it's easy to not see the impact your statements have on others. And it's easy to assume that what might be a tech issue or an oversight or something that you alone are seeing that might be a blip on your screen and not on someone else's is in fact someone who's trying to silence someone or end discussion. And so that deeply broke my heart as I saw those accusations then make their way not just in text messages back and forth, but onto things like social media and emails that come out. I really wish we were a place where we would discuss more carefully with one another. What gave me hope were a couple of things. The first is that despite that culture of distrust that has made its way into the church as well, this was a group of people that was deeply committed to really trying to discern how we can come together to be the church we proclaim Christ is calling us to be, that we were really working to do justice and figure out what it means to be merciful, to make up for our mistakes and our sins to be good stewards of our resources and of God's creation, and to really be the welcome, opening, and affirming church that Christ calls us to be. And while we didn't always agree on all those things, we were trying to do that together. And I think that is a great way to continue working together. The other thing that gave me personal hope was that I was amazed by the number of teaching and movement elders that came from small churches like mine. Amen. We usually assume that the General Assembly is a top-down institution with people of giant, well-budgeted churches making all the decisions that impact everyone else. And that is simply not the case. Most of the commissioners I served with were from small churches who had brought their ideas to the table and were excited about the way their small congregations were able to impact our denomination as a whole and were making a difference in their communities. 
And so I think there's a great hope for the Peace USA. Brian Clemens, once again, teaching under commissioner, serving on the Theology, Worship, and Education Committee. Um, I'm one who really enjoys the use of technology in ministry, so it was um, somewhat frustrating with all the glitches that were held, especially in the very beginning as the Presbyterian Center tried to iron out issues with such a large gathering, both uh, uh, in person and online. There was some good bit of uh, frustration in the process of seeking recognition in the deliberations because we were just learning the system. But sometimes uh, there were folks who wanted to be recognized and weren't being recognized. But I, as I thought about that later, uh, one of the things that the technology did for us is it prevented the loudest and most frequent voices from dominating the conversation. And for that, I, I give this. <laughs> Even with the inefficiencies and frustrations, Having a diverse group of commissioners and advisors from across the nation and around the world gather and discern God's will on a multitude of issues was truly inspiring. And there were many moments when the Spirit was evident in deliberation as previously hard stances were softened and God's something new became evident. One thing that I there was a, a moving time for me was that when the Racial Justice and Gender uh, Committee uh, presented their uh, overture, their proposal to the General Assembly, it was entitled, On Offering an Apology to African Americans for the Sin of Slavery and its Legacy. It is a powerful statement. And the moderators, bless them, invited the white people to read statement out loud while everyone else listened. It was a powerful moment and one that I will never forget. And I wonder if the Presbyterian Charlotte could consider doing such a thing at a future meeting. I'm Randy Brinson. I'm the ruling elder. I serve the Presbyterian Charlotte and Union Presbyterian Seminary. My lament is very much like everyone else's. I it broke my heart at times when the vote would be one way and people who uh, did not accept it or felt like their voices had not been heard loud enough. And so that was my lament. I had great joy in many things, but a couple that I want to lift up is one, we have learned to do worship virtually very well. <laughs> we began each morning and the West Coast thought it was early. Those of us on the East Coast thought it was a great time. We thought the 11, 11 o'clock or 11.15 ending time was a little late, but it was beautiful, well-rounded worship, and we did it all online, and it was beautiful. A couple of the things that we did and voted on that were going out to the presbyteries that gave me great hope. As a certified educator, I was glad to see that they're providing ways to keep track of who's doing education in your congregation. It will become part of the statistical report, and that way it will enable us to help the small churches that don't have staff doing education. And secondly, also dear to my heart, is that in uh, the decade of the year of the decade to end gun violence will be 2022 to 2033, and that will be a decade, 10 years, for us to address gun violence as a church. Anyone else want to speak from our commissioners that we missed? <laughs>
and how we can continue to have hard conversations and deep discernment practices it takes, trusting in your goodness to lead us all in the right direction. For we are all siblings in Christ, and we are so thankful that through Christ we are in this together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Very generous and very giving. 
He remembers every, you know, birthdays, holidays, always gives us some treat bags of candy for Easter or Valentine's Day. Even my grandkids get little goodie bags for Halloween and Christmas. So he's always been so generous, and we are grateful for that. Um, one of the things Donald likes to do is to travel. Uh, a couple of places he really, really likes to go to, Toronto and Iceland. <laughs> Hopefully in his retirement, we'll see that he you know, had more time to travel and maybe go visit a few places he hasn't been yet. So we're uh, looking forward to hearing some stories from him in the future about uh, you know, his travels as he it moves into this next phase of his life. And uh, we consider ourselves to be Donald's family. So I hope all of you feel the same way. But at this time, I would like us to give our thanks for 20 years of outstanding service to the Presbyterian Charter from Mr. Donald R. Lincoln. Thank you. 
chair of the CPM, including those for review for any consultation since the last presentation. Moderator. Right. I would like to present a member supported by Statesville Avenue to be examined for cannabis. Ryan has submitted the required paperwork and has met with the CPU. The statement of faith has been made available to you in your packet. Let us pray. Almighty God, we believe that you have given an inner call to Ryan, and we rejoice in your work. Today we celebrate that this child of yours has responded to your call, pursuing seminary studies and fulfilling the responsibilities of our presbytery care process. Give us loving and discerning hearts and grant us sound judgment as we listen to the statement of call. May we continue our relationship with Ryan as he prepares for ministry in the church. Equip him and us for your service. In Christ's name. Ron, please share a brief reflection on your sense of call and your desire for seeking ordination as a minister of the Lord and sacrament in the PPUS. Two minutes left. My sense of call started on a hot summer afternoon uh, on I 77. I know a lot of us have our own. <laughs> Uh, view of 77. Uh, mine was a little bit uh, different. Uh, it was 2016, and the year before that, uh, my wife and I were having troubles like many young couples. We had been married for about three years, and uh, unfortunately, we had separated. And when I did that, I isolated myself and separated myself from not only her, but also uh, the church. Not necessarily God, but the church. And I was off by myself, doing my own thing, and having a relatively good amount of disposable income at the time. And, uh, at this time, in the summer of 2016, I was cruising down the highway, the windows down, the sun was up, and the music going. And if you uh, remind yourself that when you're doing that, you have a cacophony of distraction. You have the wind from the doors open, the window flips open, <laughs> and the sun will go up, rushing past your ears. Uh, you have the radio going. Uh, you're trying to focus on that, listen to the words, and if you are me, you're singing with the, with the song. And if you have someone with you, uh, you're carrying on conversations as well. And of course, most importantly, you're driving. <laughs> so your focus is attention all over the place. Different areas. And it was in that moment that the word preach was impressed upon me. Uh, I was so struck and taken by that. Uh, I, was, I thought I was going to pull over on the side of the road. Uh, as anyone would do, I questioned and said, You can't be talking to me. <laughs> and so I ran. I hid, God laughed, so I ran a little bit harder, I hid a little bit harder, and God laughed a little bit harder. <laughs> and so finally, I gave in and he said, come on. And so I went to uh, speak with my pastor at the time, Reverend Barbie, and she instilled me some very pertinent information that I still carry with me today, and had me read uh, Hosea, which at the time, not until recently when I preached from Jose, I started to realize why she had me do that. Uh, so that is uh, my call story. And my sense stems from helping all those who need help. I have trouble sleeping at night knowing that I have had a blessed life and knowing that someone out there is still not able to enjoy the simple comforts that we take for granted. Uh, and so it, it's been put upon me and my mission to help all those I can help, not just with material, but 
also a spiritual and kind of theological backing and reasoning with that. So, that was over two minutes, but amen. <laughs>
just to unmute. So. Okay. There we go. Okay. Welcome, Sarah. Yes. Uh, Sarah, please share a brief reflection on your sense of calling and your design for speaking coordination as a minister of the Word and Sacrament in the PCUSA. Uh -oh, did she drop off? She must have lost. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So. We have lost her for a moment. Yeah. There she is. Yeah. She should be able to handle it. Sarah? She's got a bad connection over there. Sarah, if you can hear us, try to unmute yourself. Very bad connection. <laughs> you can tell by the way it's moving. Can you hear us, Sarah? Thumbs up if you can hear us. See how she's freezing? Yeah, her she's mm -hmm. she's got a bad connection. Mm -hmm. Can we call her and possibly put her on just an audio? If she comes back up, yes. yeah. <laughs> Does anybody have her cell phone? Text her real quick. We're gonna make this work. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, everybody. Okay. Uh, oh, do you? Yeah, do you want to? Can you? Okay, hang on. Oh, somebody's got her number. Okay. She wants to Oh. Okay. She's back. Okay. She's back. Ministry lingered in the back of my mind, 
And actually, several of my friends in high school, they even went on to become pastors. But I dare to say for a long time, I found familiar words in the words of Moses who said, Lord, I can't go. Send someone else. I am inarticulate. They won't listen. And so I took a road that I thought was safer, and I pursued a career I loved in education and teaching in public school. And that was part of the work that my soul had to have, working with kids. I came alive in the classroom. But over the next years, it was made apparent to me that there was much more to my story when I heard that still, small voice of God daring me to dream about this call that I think I felt all along. And so I gave up my career in teaching, and I waited for God to speak to me. And then, oh, oh, the years I have been gifted with at Hopewell have been an incredible time of learning on my feet. Shortly after beginning to work there, I felt that I simply had to begin seminary, and I prayed for God to remove the obstacles that stood in my way. And unsurprisingly, I watched as the path was paved for me to pursue further education, even a dual degree. I prayed that God would open my eyes to where I might be used best for God's glory, and my prayer was heard as I was blessed to gain experience from the pulpit to bedside, um, Zoom calls, and on mission trips too. And in those moments, I felt that I learned a bit more about this person that God created me to be. I have found the words that my soul must have. As we all know, the future is a promise for certain, but what I do feel sure of is this sense of call that has been with me much longer than I have been willing to admit out of fear. And so as I continue on to finish this seminary journey, I will continue to lean into the great mystery of our loving God and look forward to what my awakening around the next step in my life and career as a minister. Thank you, Sarah. Moderator, on behalf of the CPM, I move that Sarah Scott can be enrolled as a candidate for Minister of Ward and Sacrament in the Presbyterian of Charlotte. And I ask that you open the floor for questions relating to her faith statements and sense of call for ordained ministry. Amen. Thank you. The floor is now open for questions for Sarah. Uh, please note that your question should be limited with respect to the candidate's Christian service and reasons for seeking ministry. And it might be easier if we ask Sarah so that she can hear us. But will, is there a question for Sarah? Hello, Sarah. If this were a point system, I would like to give you bonus points. Mm -hmm. uh, not just for being at camp with your young people, but taking this phone call in the middle of that. <laughs> my name is Erica Funk. I am a staff member at Myers Park Presbyterian Church. My question for you is, in your statement of faith, you mentioned um, that when we come, when we are, when we decide to come and follow Jesus, that we often have um, figurative nets that we need to draw. Uh, for the transformation um, to begin. And I wonder in your whole process so far, if there have been some nets that you've had for a net that you have had to drop. In your faith statement when you mentioned nets, is there a figurative net that you have had to draw in your own life or in your own heart in order to find uh, transformation in your whole process? Going into seminary, and um, I was 
<laughs> Amen. So th this will conclude our questions. Hoping that you can hear me. Uh, the motion is before you, Mr. Chair Michelle. Are you ready to vote? We will again approve by common consent. If anyone wishes, wishes to register a negative vote, please say no. So ordered. Amen. Uh, Ryan and Sarah, please stay. Please stay with us. Moderator, will you please ask the candidates required constitutional questions? It will be my honor. Lynn, thank you so much. If you still stay back up there. <laughs> thank you, Lynn. Didn't know you were going to end up doing this job. But God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Brian and Sarah, the Presbyterian of Charlotte, having approved your testimonial and sustained your examination, now requires you to answer the following questions. Do you believe yourself to be called by God to the ministry of word and sacrament? If so, then say, I do. I do. Thank you. Do you promise in the life of the grace of God to maintain a Christian character and conduct and to be diligent and faithful in making full preparation for ministry? If so, then say, I do. I do. I do. do you accept the proper supervision of the Presbytery in matters that concern your preparation for this ministry? If so, then say, I do. I do. I do. Do you desire now to be received by this Presbytery as a candidate for the Ministry of Word and Sacrament in the Presbyterian Church USA? If so, then say, I do. I do. Amen. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church, I do now by the authority of this Presbytery receive you both as candidates for the Ministry of the Word and Sacrament in the Presbyterian Church USA. Let your names be reported on the roll of Charlotte Presbytery as a candidate for me. Amen. I'm not done. <laughs> for you both, hear this charge from Paul's letter to Timothy. Ryan and Sarah, train yourself in goodness, for while physical training is of some value, goodness is valuable in every way, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance, for to this end we toil and struggle because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. These are the things you must insist on and teach. Set an example in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. Amen. Word of God for all of us. At this time, I joyfully recognize all family members, all friends, and all those members supporting Brian and Sarah today. Let us say thank you so much.
What led you to accept this call? Good morning again, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. What led me to accept this call, particularly to bring up, is that I sensed the movement of the Holy Spirit in the very, very surprising nature of it all. I was not at all expecting to go to Rayma. I thought my ministry was going in a whole different direction. Um, I thought that I would be serving someplace else. And then one morning, somebody from Rayma called me and said, you know what, we'd like to interview you. And I was really surprised because I didn't know that much about Rayma. I knew some things about Rayma. I hadn't submitted directly my information to them, so this was a really big surprise. But you know what I thought? Okay, sure. <laughs> Why not? I'll check this out. And despite some big differences uh, between me and them, I think of myself as very urban. I lived most of my life in New York City. And most of the people at Rayma grew up within two miles of the very rural community of that place. But despite our differences, we just sat together, we had a talk, and we listened to each other. And I think they heard some of the ways that I might be able to bring gifts to them. And I heard some things that they really need. And I sensed so much, so many opportunities for them to try new, kind of, uh, new things to try new things in a congregation that is small, but that is like so many of our congregations now, so perilously close to possibly dying out. In the nine months that I have served as their commission pastor, I've already done six funerals. But you know what, there's hope. Rayma is a very historic church, and it's been in a very rural area. But it's in an area that's now transitioning rapidly. It is quickly becoming just a northern suburb of Charlotte, and it's being overrun. There are million-dollar houses being built on either side of this beautiful bucolic space. And I get the sense, though, I get the sense that this congregation really wants to give it their best shot. And I get the sense, too, that most of them are willing to pivot and to try some new things or to refine some old things so that they can now be made effective. And I'm going to give you just a quick example of that. In a congregation that has not had children in it in close to 20 years, that congregation did them and they tried something new. They partnered with another organization and they also reached out to those who were not from here. And you know what God did? God brought 50 children to our campus. Ooh. And you know what we did? We started Sunday school, the following Sunday for them. And you know what else God did? God brought 12 of those children to us for our Sunday school. <laughs> so, surprise. <laughs> surprise. What's next, God? We'll take it. We'll take it. So what? Led me to accept this call is probably, I think, the same thing that leads me to accept it every day. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Moderator, I'm going to put Bill's examination by CPM be sustained. Amen. Presbyterian of Charlotte, the motion is before you. Are you ready to vote? All in favor of the motion, please respond by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, please respond by saying nay. The eyes have it, the motion carries. Amen. With gratitude and joy, I would like to recognize family members, friends, and those who are supporting Bill today. Can you please stand so we can thank you for all of your support? As Ryan, Sarah, and Bill have dedicated themselves to you, strengthen us to pledge ourselves to them, that surrounded by affection and hope they may grow in wisdom, mature in love, and be your faithful servants. Approved by Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.
thank you so much, Deborah and Kathy. Thank you, thank you. Let's just pray for the Lord for our deserving leaders. The blessing is we're not over yet. We will now turn our attention to our committee on ministry report. Moderator, commissioners, fellow ministers, your packet will find a report from the Committee on Ministry of the Actions Taken on behalf of the Presbytery since we last met. My name, by the way, is Peter Henry. I'm one of the co-moderators of the Committee on Ministry. It is my privilege today to share that the Committee on Ministry granted honorable retirement to Lynn Thompson Bryant, effective September 4th. She has been an ordained minister for 40 years. She served on CPM and most recently served as interim pastor at Cook's Memorial, First Monroe, and Oakwell Presbyterian Church. So, um, CON would like to recognize them and invite her to speak. Lynn, where are you? Moderator and members of the Presbytery, together with those visiting today, and to everyone on Hopewell's family camp, greetings to you and to all of you, and thank you for from one who, in Jan's words, is clearly not from here, the opportunity to be with you in this way. 
By way of brief introduction, Joanne and I have both grown up in South Africa and during our 15 years of marriage have lived in three very different settings. We have two children, a daughter and a son, aged 10 and 8, and enjoy spending time together as a family and especially outdoors. I've served in the Uniting Presbyterian Church in Southern Africa as a youth pastor, a probationer, and since 2011 as an ordained minister in both urban and rural congregations. We as a family have been particularly fortunate to have been integrated very well in each of these ministries and feel privileged to have crossed the many paths that we have. Integrity, compassion, prayerfulness, creativity, diligence, approachability, careful listening, and a willingness to learn are some of the things I value and try to hold to. At the heart of my personal and ministerial outlook is the belief that the person stands on behalf of God before us and on our behalf before God. We are fight Christ meets all of us where we are from, with an embrace wider than what we are able to give expression. Our growing sense of connection to Hopewell over the last year leaves us with a deepening impression of God's call and leading toward people in and around Huntersville to be with them and for them in Christ's name. I hope at the same time to find an active and life giving place among colleagues and in time to come from in the greater Charlotte area. Thank you all the way from Johannesburg, South Africa, for your time and for your time here. Amen. Thank you, Alistair. Presbyterian Charlotte, the motion is before you. It comes from a committee and does not need a second. Are there any questions? Are you ready to vote? All in favor of the motion, please respond by saying aye. 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 All opposed by saying nay. The motion carries. Still super excited, I would like to recognize the family members, friends, and those members supporting Alistair and his family. And thank you, Alistair, for your words. Let's pray the Lord. Presbyterian service part-time temporary pastor at Davidson Presbyterian Church. Rhonda, come on up and introduce yourself. Good afternoon. My name is Rhonda McLean. I graduated Union Presbyterian Seminary. I've served for the past se over seven years in Providence Presbytery, Beaver Creek Presbyterian Church in Kershaw, South Carolina. 72 miles one way every Sunday morning. Thanks be to God, my husband drove. And so we, uh, we arrived each morning safely. That was a blessing. Never did we have any difficulty with our car or get a ticket. Though no, Lord knows we probably deserved one. <laughs> We were able to serve, and even through COVID, our church never stopped meeting. And I didn't even know it was against the law to travel across state lines during COVID. But God was gracious and kind. I am grateful for this opportunity to serve the Church of Davidson Presbyterian. I am grateful for just being able to be with that beautiful congregation. And uh, there, I have a vision for the church that I believe God has given me. And I intend to work until the season is up for working. And then I will move in whichever direction God calls me to. I thank you for your kindness and your time. Amen.
Presbyterian Charlotte, the motion is before you. It comes from a committee and does not need a second. Are there any questions? Are you ready for the vote? All in favor of the motion, please respond by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, please respond by saying nay. The ayes have it. The motion carries. Welcome, Rhonda. Rhonda, I think you have to sign the book of life. <laughs> and while she does that, on behalf of the Committee on Ministry, I move that Bill Watkins be approved to serve as temporary pastor at Rama Presbyterian Church pending his ordination. Amen. Siblings, we have already heard from Bill, so we will entertain the motion that is before you. It comes from a committee and does not need a second. Are there any questions? Are you ready to vote? All in favor of the motion, please respond by saying aye. aye. All opposed, please respond by saying nay. Again, the ayes have it. The motion carries. Congratulations again, Bill. On behalf of the committee of ministry, I move that the ruling elder Gary Blackman be approved to serve as commission pastor at Statesville Presbyterian Church, Statesville Avenue Presbyterian Church. And being commissioning Gary, if you would come up and introduce yourself. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Gary Blackman, elder at Black Memorial. About six years ago, I felt the nudge, like most of us has, and some of us ran from it. That's my minister, after losing Catholics, I'm actually asleep, what was going on? He said, I believe God is calling you to do something. Okay, so what should I do? <laughs> so we, we made an appointment down at the Union to, uh, what do you call it, a day of discernment. And it was a call. I applied, accepted, went to my first class, and that was it. I'm on a retail. Some folks came in um, and hired half my staff that Saturday. I was in my first class. But I still had a fire inside me. And I discovered that they had a leadership program. So Isaiah 6 8, here I am. I'm looking forward to serving at Statesville Avenue. I believe it's going to be a good match. We're uh, a little nervous right now. Sorry. Uh, there are some things I need from them, things that they would like to have from me. We've talked, and I'm very excited. I'm looking forward to working alongside them. And Try to put things sort of back together from this pulpit. Although we all need, all churches need it. And that's about it, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Presbytery of Charlotte, the motion is before you. It comes from a committee and does not need a second. Are there any questions? Are you ready to vote? All in favor of the motion, please respond by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, please respond by saying nay. Amen. The ayes have it. The motion carries. Amen. The pleasure is yours. We have to recognize the family members, friends, and those who support the area today. We stand and let us thank you. On behalf of the Committee of Ministry, I move the day true be received from Carlisle Presbytery as a member at large. Dave, if you will come on up and introduce yourself as well. Hi, everybody. I'm Dave True, and the, I guess uh, I'm really impressed with all the work going on in the Presbytery. And I think one of the things that makes 
makes me feel most connected with Presbyterian, reminds me of the connectional church we are, is when you see candidates for ministry, right? And the marriage between a pastor and a congregation. And one of you spoke about listening uh, to your congregation and learning from their wisdom. And um, I'm married to Albert Crawford True, who is pastor at First Concord. And I get to see this all the time. And um, for the past 19 years, I've been a professor of theology and ethics in a small school in Pennsylvania. And so I moved down here, and I'm very much in this time of listening and discerning. And I'm excited about the possibilities. And whoever said the thing about Moses, right with you. you know? no, that's not me. That's not me. But I'm, I, I want to be of service. And I'm not sure how that is going to look or if it's going to look. But that's what I'm here for, to try and be of service in some way. Thank you. Thank you. Presbyterian, the motion is before you. It comes from a committee again. It does not need a second. Are there any questions? Are you ready for the vote? All in favor of the motion, please respond by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The motion carries. Welcome day. All in favor of the motion. All in favor of the motion. It goes through the supporting day today. I know it. And I would, and you didn't. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Clerk, is there any known unknown work that we have not finished? Nope. Amen. 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 I have to say, what a wonderful day to spend a Saturday worshiping, receiving our siblings in service to the risen Christ with us, honoring those who have served long with us, hearing from our commissioners about the changes happening around our PCUSA, and again, as Dave said, hearing what God is saying to us, the great possibilities found in all of us through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's an awesome way to spend a Saturday, amen? amen. Amen. So siblings, we have come to the end of our meeting, but the continuation of our time of fellowship with lunch. Uh, before we adjourn with prayer, I just want to ask Steve, yep. kind of, there you are, I saw you back here a second ago, if we had any instructions for lunch before we dismiss. We are present here, so of course we have instructions. <laughs> of course. Um, so if you are at the front of the sanctuary, uh, we'll have you go out this door and down the hallway, kind of the way that you came in, but keep going all the way to the end of the hallway, and there'll be someone there that will show you the fellowship hall. If you're at the back, uh, the best way is to go out through the narthex and hang on left. We'll have people showing you, and you'll go outside and walk around and go in. There are trash cans uh, with leaves, so you can put your community kits in there. Uh, there's also uh, some snacks and stuff and a little carb load to get you to the fellowship hall. <laughs> Um, and um, if you did not order lunch, pay for one, we may have extra Please come. We would love to have fellowship. There'll be room inside the fellowship hall to seat. We also have um, picnic tables out in front of our fellowship hall under the oaks as we've taken the call in. So feel free uh, to uh, enjoy the company out there. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. Again, thank you so much for all of you who are joining us in attendance. Yes, for my people, my tins and some meal baskets. Yes. <laughs> Chances of milk baskets will be placed on your tables as you eat. Um, if you venture outside, which is great, please make sure that you venture inside and drop in your coins and dollars to the 10 cents a meal located on the tables. Please make sure that we participate and share in that ministry. Um, and again, I want to thank you all in attendance with us, those online joining with us. Um, it has just been a wonderful uh, meeting and gathering today. Take the information that we have heard, discerned, and take it back to our congregation and let us be the body of the Presbyterian. Amen. Family, let's pray. Oh, gracious God, we want to thank you for being with us throughout this meeting. Oh, Lord, as we leave this place, 
Send us out to be your salt. Send us out to be your light. Send us out so that we may put into practice all that we have discerned and affirmed. Send us out, God, to make a positive and blessed difference in the world that will glorify your name and break the yokes of, dom of, of, dom of domination and despair. And as many of us move towards a time of fellowship, we ask that you bless the food for the nourishment of our bodies and bless the conversations for the nourishment of our souls. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.